Uh, this is joint work with my colleague, Eric Justin, in the <coughs> Research Laboratory. And the story I'm going to tell you today has to do with a story of interacting particles in a somewhat non-standard setting where they're living in Lie groups. And uh, the problem itself has origins in the study of flocks of entities. So that's what I would motivate you with this. So, okay. In this slide, you're seeing a flock of starlings flying about. It's being looped. But you can see that there's some other extra things in the vicinity. Some birds that are going by. They are likely predators. Peregrine falcons are actually standard predators of uh, uh, starlings. And starlings want to escape from these predators by turning away. And you see this turning motion. And they actually are doing that in an erratic, coherent way. So the story I have to tell you has to do with understanding this coherence question. But before I go to that, I will show you a more dramatic illustration, which is of a much larger flock of starlings, taken a picture taken by a group that I have collaborated with in Rome. And this is a group of Andrea Cabani, <coughs> who is primarily known for his work in condensed matter physics, but he has applied physics thinking, sophistical physics thinking, to modeling the data obtained by observing starling flocks. So there's extensive video data, accurate data on positions of other large flocks. So in this static view, what you seem to see is some sort of a wave of motion taking place, moving from one portion of the flock to into the interior. And the kind of question that one would like to raise is really, do these waves have something to do with waves of information propagating, say, from an outer boundary of a flock, where some few birds have recognized a predator and they're making a turn, an avoidance turn. And this avoidance turn is in somehow being transmitted to other members of the flock and they act in harmony and try as a whole to escape and possibly even confuse the predator. All of this story is also related to a, a story in biology and uh, the folks here, the Newberg and Goss, uh, back in the early, in the 80s, uh, put forward the idea that in biology these types of situations where collective behavior seems to emerge have to do with possibly some mechanism of copying. So you do something, I will do the same thing or approximately do the same thing. And this applied in various contexts having to do with animals that graze or move or walk, what have you. And this is given the terminology allelomimesis and this is something that's widely studied by these uh, neuroethology and ethologist people in, in, in this group. And um, so my story has to do with taking from this biology to control and a, a set of ideas. So the behavior called allelomimesis, as I pointed out, has to do with copying and copying nearby animals, actually. And so there is some sort of an interaction taking place between animals that are close enough because they recognize each other. They visually observe each other. And this copying may arise in various varieties of things. For instance, you may be grazing, and then you stop grazing and move. Or you may be not doing anything, and suddenly you do something. You switch action. Or you may start from a rather quiet condition into a condition of vigilance, because you have somehow heard some in something that suggests <coughs> that there is danger nearby. So the suggestion is that this principle of allelomimesis is at work the, and this copying behavior gets propagated in a, a group of animals in order to ultimately produce something seemingly cohesive emerges. Okay. So what are the benefits of this? Well, animals can remain safe if they copy other animals that are doing escaping maneuvers, for instance. Allelomimesis also reflects some sort of positive feedback. So in my story today, I've been motivated by some prior work of our group where we concretely studied some optimal control problems and uh, interpret resulting solutions as allelomimesis. And in this context, we employed symmetry reduction techniques very much in the spirit of what uh, Tudor Ratu talked about earlier today, but in a rather regular setting, no singular stuff. Okay. So the actions are nice, proper, free, and the momentum lives are nice. And um, so in this context, one can talk about symmetry reduction. And uh, so we made, made some, uh, some results out of that. 
And then, in fact, they, there are some limiting conditions in which hidden symmetries emerge, and they seem to be also relevant. So, the references for this talk on the biological side are these two. Uh, there are others uh, that are noted in the, uh, some of these papers here. This is the paper that we published relatively recently where we use reduction techniques. And this is a paper from a group that I collaborated with which just explored very seriously starring blocks. So um, what did we accomplish in this reduction approach? So these, uh, this slide and the next slide summarize all that is there in the Proceedings of the Royal Society paper. And it's about reduction. What the rest of the talk is actually about the opposite, namely enlargement. And why do I need to do that? I need to make the case for that. Okay. So, what is the optimal control problem? So at this stage, I'm going to just state for you the optimal control in a rather abstract way. And when we talk about optimal control, you're minimizing some cost functionals, like you do in mechanics, minimizing some action functional. But in mechanics, the very minimization process, so our extremizing process, produces the equations of motion. In optimal control, I just want to remind people that you have to have equations of motion like the ones that I've written here in one, and the cost functional together. So these play the role of constraints. And in the present context, there are also fixed endpoint conditions. And where do these equations of motion evolve? They are left in variant systems on matrix Lie group G. And the G and the and the C here denote curves in the Lie algebra, but not all possible curves, curves that are constrained in some way to live in a subspace, and within them are parameters that we call control, and you need to select them so that these resulting cost functional here defined by means of a Lagrangian is in fact optimized while satisfying these endpoint conditions. So the kind of Lagrangians we favor that are interesting to, uh, uh, to purposes of our modeling effort is th something like this. There are two kinds of terms. There is terms that involve self-motion, your own cost because you as an agent or a particle are exerting some, uh, something. And in addition, you being different from the other people around you. So this is a mismatch cost. And the mismatch cost has a weight inside it, AKJ. The weights are really discrete, zeros and ones, and they correspond to element of an adjacency matrix of a graph. And so the what graph am I talking about? This is the interaction graph between the various particles. So this is a, in this present setting, <coughs> is an undirected graph. So if you can see me, I can see you, all right? And so corresponding to any such interaction graph, there is a corresponding graph Laplacian matrix, which is just a, a generalization of the discrete Laplacian we think of when we think about a linearly ordered graph. So when you do sort of discretize heat equation in, in a first numerical analysis class. And then there is also a coupling constant chi, which is positive. And essentially, this class of cost functionals have two sets of parameters. One is a discrete parameter of the graph, and one is a real number parameter, the chi, the coupling constant. And so we want to explore what happens when you play with these parameters, and then, in particular, focus on the coupling parameters and its limits. And so that's sort of the setup of the problem. And this is abstract, but the most interesting examples that pertain to what I talked about in the previous slide having to do with flocking have to do with the special Euclidean group in the plane. So rigid motion in the plane, which we denote as SE2, and or SE3 if you want to fully model three-dimensional motion. So in this context, the curves in the Lie algebra, CK, are confined to lie in this way. So there is an X2 matrix, which here in the particular example corresponds to infinitesimal translations associated with the rigid motion groups in the plane. X1 is infinitesimal rotations. The fact that the coefficient in front of translations is 1 means that each of these particles in the group is moving at unit speed. Okay? And it never stops moving. It's always moving and moving at unit speed. So what is your control? The control is this curvature term, signed curvature term in the plane for the curve that you produce in the plane. And so with such a control, uh, scalar control for each particle, there are n capital N particles, and then what, what can we do about attacking this optimal control problem? That is a powerful machinery of maximum principle due to Pontryagin and co-workers originated a long time ago, but has undergone many stages of development and extensions. 
And in that context, one can set up the Hamiltonian for the optimal control problem, which essentially allows you to recognize that this problem that I formulated in the previous uh, uh, slide has a ton of symmetry. Notice that in the Lagrangian, the group elements do not appear, so there is a global product group symmetry associated with this cost functional. And so you can do reduction of the Hamiltonian of the Pontryagin problem uh, by that big group, and so you end up with the Hamiltonian that is actually living on the dual of the the algebra of this product group, which in this case is just a direct sum of n copies of the individual dual spaces. Okay? And the, the, uh, that Hamiltonian has got coupling in it because this psi matrix reveals the coupling story. So how does the psi matrix look? The psi matrix looks like what I've written down here. So let me explain. Here, in the psi matrix looks like a giant identity matrix of size cap n by n. And then there is a coupling term, and the B in the middle is the graph Laplacian, and the P is the ma orthogonal matrix that diagonalizes the graph Laplacian. And so the story I'm telling you here is that when you send chi to infinity, this positive definite matrix here is in fact going to become rank one, and in fact becomes like this. So what that means is that if you look at the optimal control solution that emerges from applying the maximum principle, then as chi goes to infinity, everybody is going to synchronize to having the same control. And the control can be explicitly computed in one of two ways, by solving this differential equation, which looks like an oscillator equation plus a cubic nonlinearity, solve it by Jacobi elliptic functions, or do something that is standard in Hamiltonian reduction setting, and we look at the Hamiltonian uh, equal to constants uh, sets, which are level sets, and then also look at what is called the Casimir function is equal to constant level sets. Because of the symmetry, there is this universal conserved quantity is called Casimirs. Intersect them, the intersections are the solution curves for the problem. So those would, either way you can get at the solution. So these are integrable problems in the limit. But in the in limit, the, everybody seems to want to do the same thing. So the, the, I have sort of uh, I, hope, I, I sort of hope to tell you, he, uh, say that perhaps I've convinced you that there is an interesting optimal control way of thinking about this allele analysis or copying behavior if you introduce these strong coupling conditions, uh, approximately chi going to infinity kind of conditions. And there are interesting stories having to tell, uh, for us to tell even when for intermediate coupling. So the question I ask here for the rest of this talk, and please stop me if I have five minutes left, uh, I, I don't know what, what, what time is allotted to me, and I will stop, uh, I will adjust for that. So, okay, so the, uh, six I have six minutes six, left. Six minutes, six. Fantastic, I can do a good job. So, uh, uh, the, so the question is, what can I do when I have other groups? By that I mean that instead of the Euclidean group in the plane, what can I do? I have to rely on all the details <laughs> having to do with reduction. The second question is about in interesting results about intermediate coupling. And then finally, are there explicitly solvable problems like the one that I just showed you for the Euclidean group? So in this context, I'm going to tell you briefly about what is called the enlargement or extrinsic view. In mechanics, in modern mechanics, it has been noted, that thanks to a variety of people, that uh, not only reduction in the sense of, say, reduction of the Kepler problem in three dimensions to a one-dimensional, uh, one, one, one degree of freedom problem, one can also, uh, and solve it by explicitly, or you can also do some uh, enlargement. The enlargement story is much less systematic than the reduction story. In other words, a problem that looks hard can actually be viewed as a, a problem look, uh, that is constrained in some way in a higher dimensional space where the problem in higher dimensional space is actually easier. So there are various things that are known about this, such as the Kepler problem viewed as geodesic flow on SO4, something known as the uh, Collagero case studied by Kastan, Kostin, and Sternberg. So, but in control theory context, Brockett did something rather interesting, which has not been noticed very much, uh, exploited very much, which is in fact a very specific 
enlargement idea. So what he did was to show that for a certain type of uh, cost functional, it's very similar to the ones that I wrote down, but set up in a matrix Lie group context in a very general way, one can exploit the uh, maximum principle state cost state equation in a particular way so that the problem collapses to a set of matrix dynamics which have as much con convenience factor as the Riccati equations do in linear quadratic optimal control theory. So that's a very brief statement. So what does the, what does the problem look like for Brockett? He wrote it in this right invariant form. So it looks like we have a matrix equation evolving on a matrix Lie group with controls. He did not have the second set of indices I because he was only studying one copy of the group. The first set of indices J corresponds to having controls, M controls per system. So I've, I extend that story to involve N copies, but once again we have the product group set up in the same kind of cost functional as before. But what is very interesting is that if you apply now the maximum principle story, write down the co-state equation, the state equation, which is already there in the previous slide, and the Hamiltonian being the obvious Legendre transform formulation of the uh, Lagrangian the statement. And then what you do is mix up the state and the co-state in a particular way. Namely, you take Ki is equal to Qi Pi transpose. So this only makes sense because the group problem has been embedded into the surrounding vectorial matrix space, okay? So this is genuinely an enlargement. And then the K is satisfy a set of differential equations that are self-contained by involving the Ks alone, precisely because of the state co-state equations that have been implemented here. So now the next step is, this is the pre-Hamiltonian, the next step is to apply the maximum principle, which says that if you have optimal controls, then they have to pointwise maximize the Hamiltonian, and then, the, and, and, and then that you do by, a, in this context, by the simple first order derivative calculation, and you find that you have a Hamiltonian system, a genuine Hamiltonian system involving these K matrices. Well, that system actually looks like this, okay, the Ki dot equal to this, where the mu i's are actually traces of, involved traces of the BJKI, and, so, and they in effect tell you what the optimal controls are. So these Ki dot equations, in fact, can be thought of as living as the uh, Hamilton's equation you would write down on a Poisson space. In this case, the uh, Poisson bracket space associated with the dual of the Lie algebra, the general linear group, which is where you embedded the problem. So you know, the picture is one of something that looks very much like what people in uh, total lattice context did, namely discover a, 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 a lax pair. This is a matrix involving K, another matrix K. The K, K, K dot equation is, in fact, associated with a lax pair. And you have a lax pair. If you're lucky, you can actually explicitly integrate the problem. These ideas go back, back to 1968 to Lax's work, and then later <coughs> to Flaska and others. So what I have shown you is an enlargement picture two slides. Okay. So what is the relationship between induction and enlargement? Well, T star G got embedded into T star of G L N got embedded into T star of matrices of N, drop down according to Brockett's prescription. On the other hand, you go the reduction route. There is a, morph a K morphism here, Poisson morphism here, which in fact takes the Ks to the mu's. Okay. So this is the essential idea uh, that connects the two. What happens in the strong coupling limit? This is the reason why we brought up this. Well, turns out the averaging idea works out exactly when we do strong coupling limit, except that you apply the averaging to the case. So in which case, you have this very general you know, story that has nothing to do with the specific details of the specific group. And so we do claim synchronization. But the last two slides, if I may, is that if you drop the A's, but you have enough B's, then you can have controllability, then you can set up a Subramanian problem, which is now not the usual Subramanian problem, but it's a coupled Subramanian problem. Why is it coupled? Because the cost functional has this chi coupling. So model problem of this type on the Heisenberg group, if you have n equal to two, two copies of the Heisenberg group, the standard Subramanian example is this so-called non-holonomic integrator goes back to Brockett. 
These are two controls in a three-dimensional system. The third the variable generates area or rectification. Another copy of the same thing, and you couple them in this way. The subdomain geometry of this is very interesting. There is no interesting graph aspect because there are only two particles, but there is still a coupling constant chi. So if you just look at the next slide, but on the left, <coughs> this is a very familiar figure for subdomain geometry on the Heisenberg group. This is the subdomain sphere. Where, which is different from the ordinary sphere because it has these cusps of the north and south pole. What I have tried to do here is to picture for you the Subramanian sphere, in, which is five dimensional and in a six dimensional space. So, what is shown here is simply a, a slice, a particular slice, and the coupling constant chi has actually squeezed what is actually a tor torus slice down. If the chi goes up it and up and up, we're squeezing it more and more. So far, I haven't shown you any cusp in this. It's somewhere there, when I suspect, some other singularity. That's all. Thanks a lot. <laughs>